Right, I think we can get started. Um, right now, there are over 40 attendees. So, good afternoon and welcome to ASIC seminar series. Um, I'm John, the seminar coordinator. Together with me is uh, Ms. Kelly Manani, and she's our communication and IT specialist. Our associate director, Ralph Ferrero, um, also joined us. Um, in fact, um, our former um, our associate director, Phil, uh, is also here. And so, just so you know, the, um, uh, the video, the seminar is being recorded and uh, the video will be later um, available on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can, you are welcome to check out. Uh, and today we have our distinguished uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Rich um, Low Tulo, uh, joining us from UNCA. And right before um, his talk, um, I would like to invite our Associate Director, Ralph Ferrero, to introduce uh, the speaker. Ralph, please go ahead. Yes, thanks, John. Yeah, I'm, I'm honored to uh, introduce our speaker today, uh, Richard Rotuno from um, NCAR out in Boulder, Colorado. He's a uh, world recognized leader in um, mesoscale meteorology modeling. Um, and he's won um, <clears throat> numerous awards um, from professional societies and, and other uh, distinguished uh, um, agencies and so forth. And um, he's also very active uh, teaching um, both at national and international level um, it's for summer school students. And uh, he's going to tell us all about uh, weather predictability and, and hopefully tell us how much it's going to improve here pretty soon. So, so I'll turn it over to Richard. All right, thanks, Ralph. And uh, thanks to uh, Essex for the invitation. And uh, I don't think I've done a webinar yet, so this is, uh, this is my first time too. So uh, we'll see. So, um, Yeah, so uh, the way I'm going to structure the talk is uh, is to uh, go over the background and history of weather prediction, weather predictability, and uh, and then um, a little bit about the uh, about what we uh, know from the basic theory that was developed early on in the, uh, in, the in the latter part of the 20th century, and then uh, some recent developments, and then we'll take some questions. So uh, going back to the uh, beginning of uh, weather forecasting, we uh, see here this uh, this is sort of a weather map that was uh, this is from 1887, and uh, the uh, the invention of the telegraph basically allowed the uh, the uh, the plotting of a synoptic map, synoptic meaning constant time. So you could uh, get various pressure temperature information at various stations and um, and then uh, and then track the progression over time. Um, this was uh, pretty much worked for about a century until mid uh, century uh, we came to uh, World War II in the mid 20th century and uh, routine upper air soundings became uh, more common and uh, that uh, that uh, that fact uh, motivated the, uh, the uh, this group at the Institute for Advanced Study to, uh, to try to uh, initialize a model and uh, advance it in time, and then compare the um, the result to the next day's um, uh, observations. So um, this is a very important step, obviously, but one of the most important things was that uh, back in the old days. Uh, the, uh, the forecast actually depended on the skill of the forecast, uh, the skill of the forecaster. So uh, different people could look at that map on this day and predict where the uh, low was going to be the next day. And uh, Joe Smagorinsky, uh, I was a student at GFDL, and he, he uh, told the story that uh, back before numerical weather prediction, it was the uh, three finger rule, and uh, which would get you from uh, Basically, a day's progress and uh, of a low. So, use the three finger rule to tell you, uh, or try to tell you where the uh, the low is going to be the next day. So, um, anyway, uh, soon after the beginning, 
of, uh, of doing this, uh, of doing numerical weather prediction. Um, the, uh, the, um, it became uh, clear that um, the initial uh, error was, uh, was uh, something to be reckoned with. Um, and, uh, you know, gi and given the fact that you, you had a, uh, a, you know, this procedure, now you didn't, you had an objective way of measuring the forecast error. It didn't depend on the, you know, on the skill of the forecaster and not to mention the thickness of his fingers. And uh, so one could routinely then measure the skill of the forecast uh, based on the subjective measure of the forecast of tomorrow's weather versus uh, today's, you know, tomorrow's observations. Uh, on several occasions in 1956, late arriving data from the station Papa in the middle of Pacific produced large errors in the 500 million bar height analysis and forecasts. And this uh, gave rise to some uh, deep thinking on the subject. The first uh, real uh, sort of deep think uh, on this uh, was due to uh, Phil Thompson uh, back in 1957. And uh, this is the first uh, place, at least I could track down uh, of the use of the word predictability in the sense that we use it today. Uh, and I'll just three quotes from the paper, three sort of foundational quotes of this, this business is he said, the predictability of the atmosphere is not merely the extent to which its behavior is predicted in practice, but the extent to which it is possible to predict it with a theoretically complete knowledge of the laws that govern it. Even if you know things perfectly, you know the laws perfectly, you still may not be able to uh, predict the atmosphere given uh, initial condition or other errors. Well, I guess maybe initial condition errors. Um, the other thing he introduced uh, was the uh, the possibility of diminishing returns. It would be impossible to establish the point of rapidly diminishing returns beyond which further outlays for data coverage would be unprofitable. Again, it was a, it was a, a um, an important uh, observation from a practical point of view, but also from a theoretical point of view. Is there a diminishing returns aspect to improving uh, initial conditions? And forecast accuracy. The third thing uh, he brought up was the uh, the probabilistic nature of the problem and of uh, estimating probable error. After about a decade or so of uh, numerical web prediction, uh, a push uh, was made on on the part of academia led by Jill Charney here to uh, to produce a global observation and analysis uh, uh, experiment which formed the basis of the future global observation network. And uh, what he said in this report was preliminary numerical calculations indicate that if the initial state of the atmosphere were known with sufficient accuracy, the large scale motion would in principle be predictable as a deterministic system for a period of approximately two weeks. Uh, now, as far as I could tell from reading the report, uh, the preliminary numerical calculations were basically the experience, basically uh, experience based on the previous 10 years of uh, progress and then extrapolating into the near future. A deeper study of the, uh, of, of how, uh, how initial condition error uh, amplifies in a, uh, in, in a turbulent flow, which is, you know, one could argue is the atmosphere, uh, Ed Lorenz in 1969 uh, hypothesized that in a turbulent flow, for any particular future time, there's a limit below which the error cannot be reduced, no matter how small the initial error, if not zero, is made. Uh, there's a very uh, nice uh, essay on this by Tim Palmer, I could recommend to you. Uh, and and uh, he observes that this notion of, of uh, stated in, in, the, in the red uh, type here is more radical than mere sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Say, for example, as occurs in low water chaos. Um, so, basically, uh, this is a very famous diagram uh, that Ed Lorenz uh, produced in his uh, 69 paper. And in it, uh, we have a couple of things. One is the energy spectrum of this hypothetical turbulent flow. Uh, given 
here. And uh, this is uh, must be emphasized. It's, this, it's a statistical, uh, you know, it's it's an energy spectrum of a statistically uh, stationary state of the atmosphere. And uh, so we imagine that if you have a uh, error, say for example, uh, suppose it, suppose your initial error here is at, uh, at along the one quarter day line, and your target forecast is out here at four days. And that means you've got two, three, three and a half, three and three quarter days to make it from your initial condition to your final target. So if you go through all the time and expense to uh, to uh, decrease this uh, this error by about half, say to here, so so that you add one eighth for the a day in uh, in uh, lead time, then you go three and a quarter plus one eighth of a day. Uh, to get to the same point. And so as you keep having the error, you get less and less uh, you know, bang for the buck. And uh, that's uh, basically a, a, um, along the lines of Phil Thompson's uh, uh, observation that uh, there could be a point of diminishing returns. Now, the energy spectrum used in, uh, in Lorenz's calculation was a to the minus five third spectrum, uh, which uh, which has the property, which has this property that errors will grow in, in this manner, so that as you keep on increasing the accuracy through increasing the uh, say for example the uh, the scale of the of the initial condition uh, error, then uh, or de decreasing the scale of the initial condition error, it uh, responds like this to the minus five third spectrum. The last important uh, paper of this uh, of this era was uh, due to Doug Lilly in '72, and uh, he, he observed the close connection between turbulence and predictability studies, and uh, developed some uh, simple scaling that showed the for 3D turbulence with a k to the minus five third spectrum, um, since the spatial scales have uh, shorter and shorter time scales. That's a, then you have limited predictability. In two-dimensional turbulence, all spatial scales have the same time scale, and uh, therefore you'll have unlimited predictability. And if you want a more physical uh, sort of picture of this, I suggest a very nice essay by Hank Tenneke's in the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society in 1978. So, uh, uh, the argument is basically this: Suppose you could uh, define a, uh, a sort of a velocity scale through the uh, through the energy spectrum and at a certain wave number in the power law, and the uh, the energy growth time scale then would be computing on this would be k three times e of k all to the minus one half, and that gives you the formula uh, k to the n minus three equal two. So for n uh, less than three, say for example five thirds, then you have the situation where the uh, the smaller scales uh, uh, grow faster, and uh, therefore you have a situation where the small scales grow faster than the large scales, and you have the uh, the situation of limited predictability. Whereas if n equals three or or greater, then uh, then all this. Or equaling three or greater than, uh, then you have the opposite situation. And equals three is sort of the uh, threshold uh, point where, where all scales have the same time scale. All spatial scales have the same time scale. So, just to give you a feel for this, I uh, asked uh, my colleague here, Ned Patton, to, to uh, give me a, a, one of his movies of a, of a uh, turbulent flow. He's a turbulent boundary layer flow. And if you kind of keep your eye on, on the flow for a while, uh, you'll see that there are some big scales that kind of move slowly, and then some little tiny scales that are very rapid. And that's sort of the nature of three-dimensional turbulence. Large scales are slow, and uh, small scales are fast. And the other hand, if you look at, uh, say, uh, motion on the globe, which is um, Quasi two dimensional is the vorticity at 500 millibars. Then you see sort of a slow kind of molasses sort of um, 
you know, deprivation of the, uh, of the vorticity field. And in this case, all, all scales are developing you know, sort of in concert together. It's got a visual. So we see the visual difference between this and the uh, three dimensional plane. So put this in a uh, sort of a more concrete terms. Um, and uh, this is kind of what the uh, Ed Lorenz imagined the thought experiment. So you have a model and uh, and it has a certain initial error given by the blue line. And uh, you say, well, gee, I, I know what I'll do. Let's try to reduce the error by an order of magnitude. And if we have the same growth rate given by the green, lo green line, then we will get, uh, for this amount of error, we'll have an increased range by going from two plus to four plus days. Or for the same uh, lead time, we'll have this much decreased error. However, if by including um, smaller scales, the error now grows faster, given by the red line, then you still have an increased range for the same error or decreased error for the same range, but it is not as much as you would have expected uh, if the growth rates remain the same. So the decreasing initial error by resolving small scales implies faster error growth, and uh, therein lies the uh, sort of diminishing returns aspect of, uh, of the argument. Now in the actual atmosphere, uh, this is uh, the celebrated uh, Nature to engage the spectrum. I think this is an update of that, uh, where the, the atmospheric energy spectrum uh, over going from 10, 10 to the fourth kilometers all the way down to a kilometer or so. We see that the atmosphere has aspects of both the K to the minus three at large scales and K to the minus five thirds at, uh, at uh, mesoscales and shorter. And uh, I would say that it's still a sort of a uh, positive. Well, I would say there's no there's no um, uh, kind of universally agreed consensus on what explains this uh, minus five third spectrum all the way out to these rather large uh, mesoscale scales, where you, where the where the uh, assumptions of three dimensional isotropic turbulence uh, definitely don't hold. Um, but if we compute the, uh, the time scale based on the spectrum, according to Doug uh, Lilly's formula, and we see that synoptic scales, all time scales are relatively constant, and then going into the mesoscale, the lower time scales uh, start uh, becoming uh, smaller and smaller. Does the error growth uh, time scale? It, it gets it means that's faster to grow error. Uh, it takes a shorter time to grow to grow the error. So um, is these uh, these theoretical studies based on um, based on, uh, on models of turbulence uh, lack many things that the atmosphere has, and, uh, but they give they give us a certain guide, and the guide is that uh, what we expect is that uh, small scale things like tornadoes have uh, short uh, predictability time scales, and as you move up, thunderstorms, hurricanes. You know, seasonal things that the uh, the time scale move increases uh, commensurately. And the research problem is to say, well, if you have a certain current error uh, level of accuracy given by the uh, by the red red line, what you want to know is how far one can go before you reach the uh, the point of diminishing returns. So um, I want to switch now to. Uh, Mentioned my uh, colleague uh, Fuching Zhang, who left us a couple of years ago unexpectedly. Fuching uh, came to work with us uh, back in uh, 2001, I think it was, and on, on the project of predictability and in, uh, in basically uh, trying to relate uh, these ideas from, uh, from three dimensional turbulence to, uh, to more um, of a real weather situations where. All, you know, the, the full complications of the atmosphere are included, and, and including you know, uh, moist convection, uh, heterogeneous terrain, and et cetera. The list goes on. But anyway, he uh, 
at the time we were using the, the MM5 model and uh, doing things like, uh, you know, the main challenge was having a, a domain uh, large enough to, uh, to include many scales of motion, but also with a grid scale small enough to really resolve the, uh, you know, the, the full range of uh, relevant scales to, uh, to, to, do, to do such a calculation. And uh, the initial papers were uh, based on real uh, case studies um, from, uh, from the United States, uh, over the United States. And so uh, at the some certain point, we became confident enough to, uh, to, uh, to do a uh, more idealized uh, simulation. And uh, here's one, uh, a, a, a channel model with a uh, evolving baroclinic wave multiple nested domains. And uh, back then uh, I could uh, tell you, we, we didn't have automatic moving nested domains. And so I remember Fu Ching would have to go in and uh, actually move the, move kind of by hand the, uh, uh, the interior nests to, uh, to keep up with the, uh, the place where we thought the convection was gonna break out. And so um, I'm gonna show you a sequence of uh, images Inside this little box, it's the smallest this box here, which is uh, which is within the uh, um, the smallest domain, and the smallest domain having a resolution of 3.3 kilometers, so that it, it was the in in the range of what's called convection permitting scales, so in which we capture some dynamics of the uh, of the uh, some of the physics of the of moist convection. So uh, here is that little box, and here is the uh, what's plotted in the blue and uh, red colors is the um, is the difference in the uh, in in the meridial velocity. Uh, the green line, by the way, is separates the uh, the conditionally stable from the conditionally unstable. I'm sorry, the conditionally unstable to the south, and the conditionally stable air to the north of this background wave, and um, and what we see here is that as I advance in time, it's three hours, six, 12, 18, 24, 36. The initial error grows in scale and, uh, and, 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 and amplitude to the period. Uh, what Fu Ching did then was do a, uh, a sort of low pass filter, a middle pass filter, and a high pass filter. To uh, to uh, quantify the growth of the of the various scales, some small, medium, and large. Black shirt. Uh, we have small, medium, and large scales. Uh, the small scales initially the uh, the error is dominated by the air, the growth in the very small scales, and they grow very rapidly. And at the middle and the large scales, their growth rates are tied to the to the small scale. When that, when the air is saturated in the, uh, in the middle scale, in, in, the, in the small scale, then the middle scale takes over and it has a slower growth rate. And then when it saturates, uh, the, uh, the growth there is, is then uh, dominated by the uh, by the growth in, in the large scales. And this is what you would expect from the uh, from the from the arguments of the uh, Lorentz. Um, these dotted lines here are are are, are important uh, pieces of, of, of the uh, puzzle because they uh, that, that's the era when you start turning off uh, moist convection and uh, part of this uh, this line of work which is show the moist convection uh, is a uh, a very important uh, part of uh, error growth in, in the real mind. Yeah, yeah. Meteorological models and, and nature, meteorological models, I should say. Uh, I'm going to show you now a, uh, I think, sort of the, uh, the a realization of, um, of of this line of research, uh, looking at the error growth in uh, in the meteorologically uh, you know, complete models, and uh, 
And this one is due to Falco and Jude, and that's in the Journal of Atmospheric Science in 2018. And um, let me just bring up the picture and I'll describe it as we go. Uh, what you're going to be seeing here is the disturbance kinetic energy. So what, he, what, what, what he's done here, what he did, is he, uh, he, he took a, a period of time in, uh, over, over, the, over a period of two, week, uh, two or three weeks, and uh, three weeks I think it was, uh, over uh, a period in, uh, in the meteorologically active period in 2012, uh, during which there was a super storm standing. Uh, there was in the beginning of an MJO around the globe. And, uh, and then did the identical twin experiment where um, where the uh, the model was uh, was rerun with a with a very very small uh, uh, perturbation in the uh, temperature like tenth of a degree, and then watch the uh, the difference kinetic energy as a function of time. And so as I play the movie, you can keep your eye up here. You see the time it's going to be counting uh, time and hours, and uh, I'll play it uh, several times. Um, so let's, uh, let's let's play the movie. So what you see here is a uh, difference kinetic energy developing in places so that we might expect uh, convection along the ITCZ, along the Amazon. Um, and then as as time goes by, uh, the difference kinetic energy starts filling more and more space, and that shows you the upscale uh, the upscale nature of the growth of uh, era energy. And um, we get the paraclinic waves, the things start becoming displaced, distorted. And by the time you get to, um, well, you'll see, by the time you get to the end of the movie, most of the globe is covered in, in red. Meaning that you've got two completely different forecasts, uh, even though you started with a, uh, a uh, very, very uh, small temperature perturbation. It's in effect the, uh, the equivalent of uh, lots of little butterflies in disturbing the atmosphere. Right. So uh, again, small scales growing very rapidly in the areas where there's convection. Convection uh, then gives rise to uh, to growth in the larger scales, and the larger scales, as their errors start giving rise to to uh, the errors in even larger scales, and uh, so we can know the rest of the story here. All right, so the last uh, paper I'd like to talk about, again, this is uh, one of the, Hu Cheng uh, was a remarkable person. He, uh, he, um, he, he was able to fit about two or three careers in his short life. And one of the things he was really good at was uh, joining uh, groups together. And uh, this, uh, this was a, 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 an effort where he, uh, well, Jane was doing uh, sort of experimental numeric weather prediction at uh, Penn State, and he joined together the, uh, the state of the state of the science models and operational models, like this one of ECMWF, state of the science, uh, uh, and, and uh, the three model at uh, GFDL Princeton Academia, represented here by Carrie Emanuel. And uh, in this uh, series, in these experiments, uh, they did a period of uh, where they looked at uh, three days uh, with uh, twenty day forecasts you know, starting from three consecutive days uh, of an ensemble the ensemble data simulation. This is from the ECMWF IFS model. And uh, they went forward in time uh, and uh, with these, uh, these these three separate days giving them an enlarged uh, ensemble of, uh, of cases. And uh, they did one for the winter and one for the summer. And out of this ensemble, 
they initialized this series of runs with a subset of the ensemble members and integrated forward. And, uh, and here is uh, taking that same ensemble, but just reducing the initial, you know, the initial error by a factor of 10. This is even more than a factor of 10. And what you see in both winter and summer is that the error grows very rapidly. And uh, you go a little bit further, but not that much further before you get to a saturated value uh, in the uh, in global forecast. And uh, this, I think, is probably the most complete statement to date of, uh, of uh, you know, atmospheric predictability using state of the art uh, models that take everything into account as much as they can. And I think you also high rate of issue. So um, to uh, summarize, uh, Lorenz in 69 uh, basically uh, laid down the, uh, the precept for limited predictabilities for flows with error growth time scales decreasing with spatial scale. Um, Billy in his uh, 72 paper described his predictability of various idealized turbulent flows. And uh, observed atmospheric spectra suggests that in the large scale, and it's an uh, error growth time scale independent of, sc of, of scale, that's 2D. Mesoscale, error growth time scale decreases with scale. It's, that's a 3D problem. I described uh, the work of uh, Kuching Zhang and his idealized predictability experiments in limited area channel with moist convection, showing the progressive upscale error growth. In, in that model, uh, relaxing the limits of uh, of, uh, of having a limited area uh, model, Falco Good in this, uh, this uh, kind of a pioneering study of uh, using using the the, mesos the model for prediction across scales uh, on a global scale uh, showed that we had uh, forgot to mention he had four kilometer resolution globally on that on that. In that, uh, in that sim those simulations, and he showed that there was progressive upscale error growth in you know, two to three weeks to saturate the global error. Um, finally, the uh, experiments that, uh, that I just mentioned, with John et al., uh, using actual state of the art models for forecasting, uh, also showed that the, uh, the limit uh, predictability is around two to three weeks. I think I'll stop there and take questions. Thank you, Dr. Rotuno. If anyone has any questions, um, you can unmute yourself and ask them. Um, or if you do not have a microphone, you can type it in the chat and I will read it out loud. This is Tim. I have a question. Go ahead. Okay. So, Rich, nice talk. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just want to make sure, because this comes up, like, students will ask me this question. I just want to make sure I've got it straight. So, does this work mean that the answer to Lorenz's question is you cannot decrease the forecast error forever? That is, That's below, right. okay, yeah. below a certain level of initial error, further reduction error will not enhance predictability. Well, okay, qualified. It will not enhance it much. Okay. Okay, I just want to make sure. Yeah, it, it's it's a diminishing. It's fundamentally a diminishing returns argument. Thank you. I do have a text question. Um, I'll read it out loud. Today's weather forecast seems to have been improved by a lot compared to the time when Ed Lorenz predicts what the limit of weather forecasts would be. Regarding the progress in computer, what do you think would be the upper bound of weather prediction? Uh, the upper bound, well, it kind of depends on, uh, you know, let me, let me just step back a moment. I mean, th this is the global forecast for global, you know, basically whatever's going into, um, into the uh, into the estimate of 500 millibar heights. Um, so this is the global bound on that aspect of, of weather. 
um, yeah, so uh, it, um, yeah, so I, I think the answer is, uh, yeah, this is about it. <laughs> as far as we know, this is it. Now, if you get into more seasonal things, then, then other things come in into play, uh, things like uh, the oceans and you may have you know, some predictability and then we start departing from the, uh, you know, there may be some skill in going into seasonal forecasts and because there's some skill in uh, because there are boundary conditions and that may, uh, may uh, you know, fix the long wave patterns in one way or another. Great, thank you. Also, Kyle Diedrich just um, messaged me saying he has some questions. Um, Kyle, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I was just, um, it's, it's maybe you already sort of answered it, but I'm just curious about um, coupled models. Uh, I work uh, for the Navy at Carter Rock. There's um, a lot of emphasis on ocean modeling now. Uh, it's being done at Fleet Numerical. Uh, and nav oceano, and a lot of that depends on the coupling with the atmosphere. So I'm just wondering if there's even less predictability potentially in the ocean, or with exchange of errors, or um, would the, would they be more or less independent of each other, error wise? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't work in, yeah, I, I don't do this kind of work about ocean model coupling and um, and its effect. But I know like this, in these experiments, um, it, even if it's, you know, it's coupled, the ocean is uh, slow. So I, I don't know how much it, it would vary on on, on, on a two-week uh, time scale, you know, to the extent that it would fa affect any of these kind of calculations here. So, uh, yeah, on a very long time scale, also on very short time scales. If you have a hurricane passing over the over the ocean, it's going to uh, stir up the next layer and cool off the ocean, make things. Uh, you know, um, it has to be taken into account if you're doing short term uh, forecasting. Um, but on the other hand, uh, long term, um, yeah, I would think if you're doing very long term forecast, the only. It's, sort of a signal that you may have is uh, in the ocean because the atmosphere is as, 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 this, as this figure shows really you know states become pretty much the atmospheric states become decorrelated by the time you get to uh, almost two weeks so unless there's uh, some you know, I, I can't imagine that the ocean is going to vary that much in, uh, in that period, you know, on, on the large scales in that period to affect this kind of decorrelation of the of atmospheric states in two weeks. Thank you. So we have quite a few text questions um, that I will read out loud now, but if any of these people want to contribute and discuss that, go ahead and unmute yourself, no problem. This is from um, David Novak. He asks, would you agree that the Zhang et al. 2019 result, about 12 days, is more pessimistic result than Junt? 2018, 14 to 21 days. If so, why? Uh, wait a minute. I, 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 could, I couldn't hear all that. Okay, I can I can repeat it. It's, um, would you agree that the Zhang et al. 2019 results about 12 days is a more pessimistic result than Junt 2018, 14 to 21 days? Uh, yes. <laughs> he says, if so, why? Oh, um, well, because uh, it's a, uh, yeah, th th this is, well, th this is a result based on, um, well, I mean, just, just, okay. It, it is more pessimistic just based on the, on the time, on the saturation times of these errors. Um, now, I, I, I'm not sure why this is a, uh, these are ensemble runs, many ensemble members. There's some differences between the Falco's uh, Jute paper. He, he only had you know, a, uh, identical twins, two, meaning two, uh, two simulations, uh, but they were run at, at higher resolution, four kilometers, where I believe these were at uh, seven or nine kilometer resolution with the, the 2019 paper. So there were some differences there. Um, in terms of um, 
and, you know, it, there are some differences that could explain the few, the the uh, the differences in, in the uh, saturation times for these errors. Yeah, hey, hey uh, Dr. Rotano, I don't know if you can hear me. This is Dave Novak. Yeah, no, no. Uh, if, if that's the case, that 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 may imply you know resolution does matter to some degree. Um, you know, maybe we're all just grasping at straws a bit to think a little further out than say 10 days or 11 days, but, you know, and maybe that hope of, you know, super, super computers with uh, processing to have a global, you know, one kilometer simulation that maybe you'd get to 18 days or something like that. I guess that's kind of what I, maybe that's a bit of your response is that, you know, there maybe is a hint of that, of that um, hope. Um, with well, yeah, the other thing is that the, the, this covers, um, um, yeah, I think, I think that goes results for just for the winter season, actually for the fall, it's somewhere between these two. Uh, it was the period of a uh, super storm St Sandy. So I think that was in October. Right. Of that year. And, uh, yeah, well, somewhere between 2 and maybe 3 weeks to some, some skill. These, these would say, no, definitely not. Right. Right. Yeah. Th thanks very much. Yep. Yep. This next question is from Gavin Schmidt and Gavin, you can also do the same and unmute yourself and ask it. So they ask, what about, oh, I just heard somebody. Or maybe I didn't. What about contingent prediction? IE certain initial conditions that might lend itself to greater prediction than average, IE a stratospheric sudden warming event. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not yeah, I don't, I don't know about those things. I'm not, I'm not sure I understand uh, the question. How, how long scale? How how far in the future does one forecast those those kind of things? Gavin, are you still here? Yeah, uh, it, it's more that if we can detect that something like that is going to happen and and they're predictable within a few days, they tend to have very long lasting impacts as the as the um, signal makes its way to the surface. So it's possible that you could have certain initial conditions where, for instance, northern hemisphere uh, winds could be uh, could be predicted uh, much longer than your average ten or twelve days. So, so the issue is like, you know, is there, is there uh, are, are there uh, variations around the mean uh, of you know greater situations of greater predictability versus lesser predictability? Well, I, I would think, yeah, I would agree with that proposition. I mean, all of this, stuff, even going back to the the original studies. Turbulence. I mean, it's uh, these are statistically steady flows. You know, you know, many, many states. You're averaging over many realizations of the atmosphere to form the energy spectrum, and then from those realizations, you're taking draws or you know, random, random members, and uh, and then looking at their difference, which would be small, and then you track it over time. But in a particular case. You may find that oh, here's a particular case where right, I can start off now and I can predict much further than what these these uh, these uh, graphs suggest. So these these are average, you know, these are these ensemble averages. That's the average behavior of the atmosphere. Thank you. Thank you. So we have three more text questions. Um, this one's from Zhao Wen Li. Does weather predictability time scale decrease with increasing latitude? Yeah, that's that's a it's an interesting question. Uh, my colleague here, Palco, Jet, has a paper on this in uh, twenty uh, I think twenty twenty, uh, showing that um, at least within the context of his experiments, it seemed to have longer. Uh, a longer predictability times in the tropics for counterintuitively. And I think this has been found previously in uh, in earlier studies as well, uh, numerical uh, modeling studies, and, uh, and that the uh, that the predictability time is uh, the lead times are, are longer in the tropics. And um, yeah, the um, I was talking to him the other day, and he said, "Well, the latest idea was that." Uh, I can go back to my energy spectrum. Uh, you go back to the energy spectrum. Go back to the energy spectrum.
Yeah. Yeah. So the latest idea is that um, in the tropics you tend to have a k to the minus three all the way up through synoptic scales, which means that this uh, the time scale keeps on getting longer and longer and longer. So you, so this means rapid, and short scale means you error saturate rapidly. But as you get to the longer and longer time scales, you may uh, just you know uh, go to a point where they're not where they're not saturating. You just you just have a longer longer time. So it's sort of uh, paradoxical in a way. The k to the minus is it's not paradoxical, but it's counterintuitive. The k to the minus three, if if allowed to go on and on and on, uh, uh, implies uh, longer and longer uh, time scales for error growth. But that's the idea. That's just an idea at the moment. Thank you, um, Anil Kumar. You also can unmute yourself and ask your question now. Hey, Rich. This is Anil here. Uh, good to see you after a long time. Uh, <laughs> How are you? <laughs> yes. Uh, 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 my question is, you know, about alias. What's the future of alias then? If you're running, let's say, in one day, uh, you know, in future, if you're running alias globally. Say with the computer efficiency, uh, can we solve this issue, or what's the future? I mean, if we are looking forward to that. Well, I mean, uh, the LES is uh, an example of LES. Yeah. So um, yeah. So so LES is is basically uh, you. What you can do with LES is is maybe uh, get away with um, with not having you know having a better parameterization. So it, you may have better transport phenomena, um, but as far as is it's enhancing predictability, that's it. that's you know, in terms of a better initial condition. This is definitely this this kind of flow is the poster child of uh, of limited predictability because of uh, Ed Lorenz basically envisioned. You know, the backstory on the, on the Ed Lorenz paper, there's a paper that Chris Snyder and myself published back in 2008, where we noticed that in the Ed Lorenz study, going back here, um, you assume the K to the minus five thirds all the way through the atmosphere up to some energy containing scale. And in this, in this period, it was only, uh, First, becoming uh, clear, the first observations of atmospheric energy spectrum on large scale due to Wynn Nielsen uh, showing that K is actually K to the minus three or so for large scale motions uh, had not yet, uh, yet uh, permeated the, uh, the literature. And, uh, and also, from a theoretical point of view, the, uh, the studies of Kreitman showing that the uh, two dimensional flow, which the atmosphere arguably is on uh, on, on large scales, as it takes place within a thin shell around the Earth. Um, that uh, theoretically one expects k to the minus three. So this was uh, unknown to uh, Ed Lorenz as he was writing this paper. Uh, so um, yeah, so if you so if you have a k to the minus three spectrum. Yeah, you're definitely in the in, in the other end range where where the small scales are uh, they rapidly saturate okay, and uh, and therefore the uh, so so yeah going to LES won't won, won increase your predictability but it, what it will do for you is uh, is uh, maybe give you a better uh, a better uh, estimate of you know, transfers over. Uh, Transfers over uh, vertical transfer, a better boundary layer model, basically. All right, thanks, Rich. Good to see you after a long time. Yeah. Okay, I have one last question um, from Jin Wong Yu. They ask, given your talk about the predictability, do you think alternative per alternative approaches such as machine learning slash deep learning would improve the weather prediction, or do you think those approaches would also be limited in terms of the capped predictability in the end? Well, I mean, um, yeah, machine learning uh, learns from, from learns from the model and the data. 
I mean, predictability is essentially a model thing. I mean, uh, the, the, this, these questions didn't come up before we had numerical uh, weather prediction. Um, and so uh, I think if the, if the machine learning is going to learn from the model, it may, it may help with things like uh, the earlier questioner had about certain states of the atmosphere being more or less predictable, more or less predictable. I think it will help there. In terms of sort of the basic on average uh, predictability that we're talking about here with these uh, you know, ensemble averages and uh, ensemble average error growth, uh, I, I, I don't I don't see it uh, helping much with that. But uh, that's just you know, still. Yeah, that's my view. Subject, okay. of course, <laughs> giving get even better information. Well, thank you, Dr. Rutino, for um, that great talk, and thank you to everyone for attending. Um, I do want to announce that we have a special seminar later this week as well, um, also fully remote. Um, we have a speaker from University of South Florida coming. If you go to our website, news.essic umd.edu or just await John's email. You can learn more about that speaker, but thank you everyone. Have a great day.